Today in the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab, we are pleased to welcome back one of our very favorite guest speakers, Melissa Barker. Melissa is a certified archives manager and public historian currently working at the Houston County, Tennessee Archives and Museum. She lectures, teaches, and writes about the genealogy research process, researching in archives and records preservation. She conducts virtual webinar presentations across the United States for genealogical and historical societies. She writes a popular blog entitled A Genealogist in the Archives and is a well-known genealogy book reviewer. She has been a professional genealogist for 18 years with an expertise in Tennessee records. She has been researching her own family history for the past 32 years. Today's presentation is titled Breathing New Life into Your Boring Ancestors. There is no such thing as a boring ancestor. Many genealogists will say they have boring ancestors because they can't find the records or information for them. Learn from a seasoned genealogist and archivist how to locate records and information to bring those boring ancestors back to life. So with that, I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Melissa. Thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate you having me today. Um, we are gonna talk about breathing new life into your boring ancestors. And like my introduction said, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a boring ancestor. Um, I think anyone and everyone who has ever walked on this earth has a story to tell. And as genealogists and family historians, that's our job is to dig up those stories um, and to bring our ancestors to life, not only to us, but to our family members and to the world at large. One of the things that I feel like genealogists or family historians don't realize is, is this is just not for you or your family. Because when you do this research and you leave your research for others, then it lives on. So that's why it's important that we do our research thoroughly and that we tell our ancestors story. So we're going to talk about how to make our ancestors alive again and not be so boring. And we're gonna do this through a timeline, through timelines. Um, I use timelines in my genealogy research with every single one of my ancestors. And you can do online timelines or you can do pencil and paper timelines, whatever's comfortable for you. I just use a Word document. I put it in my ancestors online file uh, that I have on my desktop. And I do a Word document for a timeline. I feel that because I am a learner, I'm a visual learner, uh, looking at timelines helps me to see holes in my research. Um, and it actually helps me to see the story develop year by year. So a timeline is actually just a listing of life events arranged in usually chronological order. Um, what I usually do is I put the date of birth at the top and put the date of death at the end, and I fill it in in between. One of the things that I try to do is I try to get a piece of information about that ancestor for every single year that they've been on this planet. Now, that's very difficult to do, and I can tell you that I don't have not one ancestor that I have been able to fill in every single year. But it's a goal, and it's something that I try to strive for. So again, a timeline will start with the birth of that person, and maybe it ends with their death date. Now, I put in parentheses some exceptions. The reason I put some exceptions is because there are things that happen pertaining to that ancestor that could happen after their death. And one of those perfect examples is if their estate goes through an estate or a probate, you're going to have records and things, not necessarily that they actually did, but about them. And so that may be something you want to include in their timeline. A timeline also includes vital information such as birth, marriage, and death dates. But I would encourage you to not just have vital information on your timelines. Search for other information, search for quirky information. I like to say that I like to know what my ancestors had for breakfast. I wanna know what their hobbies were, um, what trouble did they get into, what, um, Awards did they get? What were they known for? Things like that. I want to know everything about my ancestors. So don't stop with just a birth, marriage, and death date. Um, a timeline can also include any event in that person's life, uh, whether you know, it's small or something big or something in between. If it happened to them, uh, then, or if they did something, then it's something you should be putting on your timeline because it may also help to explain events that happen after that event. You never know when that might come into play. I would also encourage you to include historical events in your timeline and not necessarily events that include your ancestor, but historical events from where that person lived in their community uh, or maybe in that state where they lived and even um, world events. 
because any of these events that happened around your ancestor during the life of your ancestor could have had an effect on them. Now, there are some ancestors that sometimes a lot of these events just didn't affect them at all. Nothing, you know, they still kept on going and nothing changed. But there are many of our ancestors that an event really upheavaled their lives. It caused them to move. It caused them to do something in their lifetime because of an event. So we're going to use, during this presentation, I am going to use uh, my husband's third great grandfather. I'm going to use his timeline to help us understand what um, a timeline is and how to find records and to bring our ancestors uh, alive and not be so boring. So my husband's third great grandfather is Jesse Glasgow. He's actually one of my favorite people to research. Uh, I don't know if you have one of those kinds of ancestors that they're just your favorite You're, for any whatever reason. He's my favorite because yes, I've been able to find a lot of records on him. But it's my favorite because he was very active. Um, he, was, he was into politics. He was a very much a big proponent of education. Uh, uh, he was out there and he did things and there was records. But he just comes across as a very interesting man and someone that I probably would have loved to have known. So here is his basic timeline. I start with his birth year and put his death year. And then in between, for me, basic is all of the census records that I could find for him at, during his lifetime. Now, I am still missing the 1830 and the 1820 census. I cannot find him in those censuses. And so it's, you know, I'm still looking for him there. But I did get the 1840, 1850, 1860, 1870, and 1880. And of course, we know the 1890 does not exist, at least for Tennessee. Uh, and so this is his basic timeline. Now, I do have that 1865 run for Tennessee House of Representatives in red there. Now, I put that in there to show you as we start adding to the timeline. I actually found this piece of information by accident. I was not looking for it. I had no idea it existed. I had no idea he ran for office. But I would do something that I do very often with a lot of my ancestors. I go to Google Books. If you're not using Google Books, I would encourage you to do that. But I go to Google Books very often, and I'll just put all my ancestors' names in there to search. And this particular day that I put his name in, there were publications that came up and showed me that he was in this publication. And what it was is a lawsuit from 1865 where some candidates from a particular election were contesting the results. The top two uh, candidates were saying that each one of them had won. So they took it to court. And, and uh, when they were gathering the information for this court case, they gathered all of the election results. And all of those were printed in this publication from 1865. Well, Jesse Glasgow was actually involved in this election that was being contested. Uh, he wasn't running for that particular office, but he was on the ballot. And so when they were recording all of the information for this investigation, his was included just by the sheer fact that he was on the ballot. And so I was able to find that he ran for Tennessee House of Representatives. Unfortunately, he only received four votes. But the fact that he's listed in these records is the, probably the only way I would have known that he actually ran for office. One of the things that I like to find, um, if I can, is information that happened between the census. So we know that the census was taken every 10 years starting in 1790. And a lot can happen in 10 years. If you've ever done enough research with your family, uh, you found information in between those census. I mean, you can find a tremendous amount of information in those 10 years. Our family members actually can do a lot of different things in between those census records. Uh, and so when you're looking at a census for, let's say, 1850, and then you look at the census for 1860, and your ancestors haven't moved, they haven't seemingly done anything, they have the same occupations and everything, don't discount the fact that a lot of could happen in those 10 years. So here's the 1840 Davidson County, Tennessee census for Jesse Glasgow. Uh, Davidson County is actually where Nashville, Tennessee is. I live about an hour and a half due west of there. Um, and so here he is in the 1840 census. Now, many of you probably will know that the 1840, 1840 census is actually a two-page census, and this is just the first page. 
And as you probably already know that um, in the census records before 1850, they did not list everyone in the house. So they only listed the head of house and then they used tick marks to indicate each person in that household. So this is Jesse Glasgow in the 1840 census. So again, it's up to me, this is a basic record, something that I find on all of my ancestors or census records, I put those on their timelines. So a lot can happen in 10 years. I have found records and things where my ancestors uh, married and divorced in those 10 years. And you know, I may not have even known that if it wasn't for the fact I was looking for other records. If I just went by the census records, it would look like that they never even married because they were single in one census and they were still not married in another census, but yet they married and divorced in between. And they may not always indicate that they were divorced uh, on the census. Another thing that can happen is that children can be born and they can pass away in 10 years. I don't know how many children I have found in between those census years that were born and then unfortunately they pass away. So they're not gonna show up in census records. And if, especially if you're looking at a time when birth records were not uh, necessarily available, they're not gonna be in birth records, they're not gonna be in census records. And so if you can find them in other records, it helps you to fill in that timeline. There are numerous record sources that have been consulted for the time, those 10 years in between the census and, and uh, the whole time of your ancestors' lives. Um, one of the things that I encourage genealogists is to go to archives, go to libraries, archives, university library and archives, museums, genealogical societies, historical societies. There are absolutely records everywhere. And these are records that you probably are not gonna find a lot of them online. Some of them are online, but they're gonna help you fill in those gaps in your ancestors timeline for each of those 10 years in between the census. So what kind of records am I talking about? What kind of records um, would I encourage you to look for to help you to tell your ancestors story, to make them exciting for you and to also to fill out that timeline? Well, we're gonna use Jesse Glasgow because I have several records for him. And one of the first records I would encourage you to look for are tax records. And so why tax records? What can tax records tell me? Tax records are not necessarily that informative, but tax records are taken and paid every single year. And so if you're looking to fill in your ancestors timeline, this is a fantastic way to do that. Um, I use tax records to fill in each of those years that are on my timeline. So this is actually an 1885 Stewart County, Tennessee tax receipt for Jesse Glasgow where he paid his taxes. Uh, I can tell you, you're gonna find out that the, all of these, majority of these documents I'm gonna show you were actually in one big collection that I actually stumbled across a few years ago. And so this is a tax receipt. Uh, this is a tax receipt from his records. I mean, these were records that he had in his possession. This is not found in the government uh, records, although the tax records do exist for this county and he is listed in there. But this particular receipt was the receipt that he would have been handed after he paid his taxes. So he would have put it in his pocket, put it in his wallet, taken it home, and it survived. And um, it's actually uh, exists today. So the next type of record I encourage you to look for are property records. Um, property records for your ancestors if your ancestors bought property or sold property, this is where you're gonna find those records. And it helps you find information in between those 10 years between the census because maybe they bought their property but it wasn't a census year. And you may think to yourself, but my ancestors were poor, they never had property records. They never had property, so why would I look in their property records? Well, there's more than just purchasing actual land and dirt in property records. There's other things uh, like personal property. Maybe they bought a mule, maybe they bought a horse, maybe they sold a horse or sold a mule, bought furniture. Um, those are also kinds of property records that you can also look for. And so this is actually a deed um, dated March the 10th, 1881, where uh, J.S. Lee is selling property to, to Jesse Glasgow. Uh, he, he actually had several pieces of property during his lifetime. And so I have all of those deeds and it makes it very interesting for me to see the kinds of properties that he had when he bought and sold. 
And I can tell you that he uh, lived not too far from where I live today. And so I can go and I've tried to figure out where his property is located. It's kind of fun to do that. But property records, and like I said, don't think just land. Think any kind of property. They could be mentioned in the property records. Uh, vital records, that, that's again another basic genealogical record to look for. So birth, marriage, and death records. Again, in between that 10 year time span, you may find that uh, there was a marriage, there was a birth, there was a death. Uh, and so that's something we want to find because if we just go from census to census until they're dead, you're, you're not gonna have a whole lot of information on your ancestor. And so this is actually a marriage record for Jesse Glasgow when he married Hannah Boyd, September 2nd, 1835. They married in Nashville, Tennessee in Davidson County. Uh, and so this is the record that I have for them. And I'm able to put it on not only his timeline, but also her timeline. Remember, this is my husband's third great grandparents. And so I'm also researching the Boyd family. And so I can add this to her timeline as well as Another type of record that I really encourage genealogists to look for are court records. Now, you may think to yourself, but my ancestor was not into trouble. He didn't, you know, he didn't do anything bad to be in court records. There are all kinds of different kinds of court records besides criminal records. Uh, there are civil records. Maybe they had a land boundary dispute with their neighbor. Uh, maybe someone didn't pay them um, for a loan that they had given to them. And so court records can be a true treasure trove of just pure information. Like this document here, this is actually a guardian bond. Um, Jesse Glasgow's daughter had passed away. Her name was Mary Glasgow. Um, and so she was married and her husband passed away. And so they are the Harrises and they had children. Once the parents had passed away, there was no one to take care of the children. So Glasgow, uh, Jesse Glasgow stepped up and became the guardian of his own grandchildren. And so with this document, I got two for one, actually. I got the document and the fact that he was the guardian of his own grandchildren, and it lists the grandchildren, which is fantastic. But I also got Jesse's actual signature. Now, many times on these forms, on uh, court forms, land forms, a lot of the writing you see is actually the clerk doing the writing. And in this case, you can look at this, you can tell the clerk pretty much wrote everything on this document. But if you can see where that red arrow is, that is actually Jesse Glasgow's signature. I have several examples of his signature. And as you can tell, it's different from the rest of the writing on the document. And so I got two things. I got this document and I got his signature. I'm another record source that I really like to... Office, Sorry about that. I'm actually at work. Um, is school records. Uh, genealogists tend to not look at school records that much. I think they think, well, I don't really care to know my ancestors' grades, but there is so much more than just grades. Uh, school records are generated on a year to year basis. So that's another reason why to look for these records. Um, and it's also great to look for records, not only for your ancestor, but your ancestors' children, which are also your ancestors, in the school records. Uh, you can find school records actually for people who didn't go to school. Uh, the, there's, the reason that happens is, as adults, they may work for the school system, and so they may have records in the school records. Um, also, as an adult, maybe they chopped wood for the one-room schoolhouse. Maybe they delivered coal to the one-room schoolhouse. Maybe they built cabinets for the school. And so they would be in the school records. Uh, school board minute books are absolutely fantastic. Uh, they, maybe they had a beef with the school system for some reason, and they went to the school board to bring that beef to the school board. And they'll be in the school board minute books. So this is actually a receipt, as I told you at the beginning that I felt that Jesse Glasgow was a, a proponent of education. This is a receipt from the Cumberland City Academy School from June 15th, 1891, where Jesse Glasgow is paying $5 for his subscription to one share in the Cumberland City Academy. Uh, and so the Cumberland City Academy actually was not too far from where he lived. And uh, I also believe, I have not got 100% documentation yet, that he also paid for his grandson to go to Vanderbilt University in the 1800s uh, to attend college to become a doctor. 
So I have not found the, uh, I found where he has went to Vanderbilt University. I found that documentation, but I have not found, uh, chased the money down. So now we're back to Justin Glasgow's timeline. And as you can see from the documents that I have shown you, we can add that to, we can add that to his timeline. Uh, as you can see, we have his marriage record from 1835 uh, to Hannah Boyd. And then the deed, which I showed you from 1881, and then the receipt from the paid taxes from 1885. Uh, and 18, 1891, remember I just showed you where he paid that share for the Cumberland City Academy, and then that uh, guardian appointment in 1892. Now you can see that that guardian appointment came not too far before his death. Uh, and so he was already an elderly gentleman. He was sickly, uh, but he was taking care of his grandchildren. So we're starting to fill out this timeline. And I really can start seeing a story of his life coming to life. Uh, and each little piece and part that you add to your timeline. And when you look at the timeline, I guarantee you're going to get excited and it's going to make you want to find more. So why look in archives for these records? Um, archives, libraries, historical societies, genealogical societies, and don't forget those university archives and libraries and museums, uh, they have records too. Anywhere you can find records that are being preserved and available to the public is an archive, whether they have the word archive in their title or archive on the building. Uh, they house the records that um, unfortunately are not online or even on microfilm. Now, there are tons of records coming online on a daily basis, but there are still so much more sitting in our archives that we as genealogists need to access. We in an archives, and I'm actually at work today. Someone was just at my door. That's why I looked that way. Um, I went work today, and archives receive records donations almost on a daily basis. Uh, and so this is a photograph of a type of donation that we have gotten. This is the Lyle Family Records collection that we received. And people ask me all the time, well, what kind of stuff can I find in an archive? Just look at this photograph. There is literally a little bit of everything. There's a um, ledger book. There's a store ledger book. There is scrapbooks. There's newspaper clippings. There's photographs. There's receipts, invoices, postcards, letters, all kinds of records. And none of this is online. So if you're researching the Lyle family, this would be a treasure trove for you. Uh, and so there are records collections like this in so many of our archives. Uh, many of our archives, of course, understand the importance of historical and genealogical records, and they're going to maintain these records in their facility. It may be you have to reach out to them to find out what they have in their archive. Now, if you're like me, you don't get the opportunity to travel that much. I work full time and I'm not a huge fan of traveling. But a lot of my, my ancestors are actually from West Virginia, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and I live in Tennessee. Well, for the past 32 years, I have been working with libraries and archives and all of these repositories from Tennessee by using email and te the telephone and actually writing letters. And I've done very well with my genealogy research. Now, there are going to be a few records that I'm going to have to go to see. But for the most part, I've been able to do my research from a distance. Uh, this is actually one of the photographs that I took of our archives here. Uh, the books on the, that you see on the back wall there, many of those have been digitized or microfilmed and you can get those online. But the boxes that you see there on the right, uh, all of those, nothing in those boxes has been digitized or microfilmed. I'm asked all the time, well, what's taking you so long? Why can't you get this online? You have to understand that it is um, a process. It's a long process. It takes many man hours to digitize every single piece of paper. Uh, and you can't run it through a feed scanner. You have to do it one page at a time, laying it on the scanner because you don't want to damage any records. Another reason why you want to look in an archive is you want to accomplish the reasonably exhaustive search. I hear genealogists all the time say, I'm done with my genealogy. I've found everything I need to find. And I bet you I could go find more records for you. Or like I've talked about, uh, my ancestors are boring. There's no records. I can't find anything. They were just dirt farmers. They, there's no records for them. If you don't do a reasonably exhaustive search, then it's difficult for you to prove the information that you have. And so we need to turn over every rock we can find, uh, go to every facility, contact them by email, uh, call them on the phone, talk to them about what they have so that we can do an exhaustive search to fill in that timeline. 
So what is exactly a reasonably exhaustive search? This is from uh, Evidence Explained, citing history sources from Artifacts to Cyberspace, the third edition revised 2017 by Elizabeth Sean Mills. And the, the definition she gives is requiring thorough use of all known records relevant to the research problem and application of all appropriate methodology. So what you take away from this is that you don't need to give up. Uh, you need to look at every record source. I have found records in places I never thought I would find records. Uh, and so it's important that you keep searching because in an archive setting, there are people bringing records into us that are found in their attics, in their basements, in a barn, in an old abandoned building all of the time. And so if you've already been to that archive and looked at every record that they have, when you leave the very next day, someone could walk in with a bunch more records that they want to donate. So that's why it's important that we keep searching. So what types of unique records are in an archive? And this is one of my favorite things is to share some records that can be found in archives. And a lot of times when I share these records, people will say, oh, I didn't realize that I could, that those were in an archive or that those would even exist. And so I hope you enjoy looking at some of these records. Um, archives have some of the most unique records collections because a lot of these records uh, were generated by humans and humans are all unique. Uh, many archives try to put as much of their records collections online. I can tell you during COVID, um, archivists, so a lot of times when the archives were closed, archivists were either in their building uh, with their doors shut, working vi uh, very uh, vigilantly, or they were sent home to work which means by the time we've gotten to where we can start opening up again is that there's a lot of records that have been digitized, a lot of records that have been indexed. Uh, and so a lot of these records have been sitting on shelves for years and they have been able to finally get to them, which is great for us. So there's vast amounts of records uh, sitting in archives waiting for us to discover them. So here is a document that I found in an archive that honestly at the time probably would have been tossed away, thrown away. This is what we call ephemera. Ephemera are those records that normally would never have been kept. Uh, when they were produced, they were used for, they were kept for a day or two, eventually thrown away. This is actually a post office receipt for Jesse Glasgow. Now, how many of us go to the post office, we purchase a roll of stamps, or we uh, mail off a package and we get a receipt for what we paid for? Well, this is what this is. He got a receipt, he sent one letter, to his son, George Washington Glasgow in Cuba, Missouri. Uh, this is dated May 26, 1883. And he mailed it from Erin, Tennessee. Erin, Tennessee is actually where I am physically located today. This is where I'm at. And so it was very, very neat to find this document and the fact that it still existed. And so we add that to his timeline. And you may think to yourself, well, this just doesn't give me you know, any earth shattering information about my ancestor. But think about it, you now know that George Washington Glasgow, if you didn't already know, uh, was alive in 1883, that he and Jesse were communicating by letters. Uh, and so maybe we can find those letters. I don't have them in my possession, but maybe someone does. So it gives us more research knowledge to go look for. Vertical files are a fantastic record source I've encouraged genealogists to use. Uh, vertical files are in almost every archive. Sometimes they're called subject files. Um, I've also seen them called morgue files. Uh, they're unique. They're one of a kind. I think I'll, most things that are in them are one of a kind. I like to say they're kind of like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get when you look into vertical files. Uh, and so these are in every archive. You may not see them in the research area where you are sitting. They're probably behind closed doors. Uh, and so you'll have to ask the archivist about them. There are a hodgepodge of records, literally. Um, you may open one file and there is just all kinds of different kinds of documents in that particular file. And so these are some miscellaneous records that are from the Hooper surname vertical file. Vertical files you're gonna find are organized by surname or subject name, and you'll have to get an index to look for those names. And here's a photograph of some of our vertical files here at the archives. As I said, they'll either have a surname or a subject name. And when I say subject name, it could literally be any kind of subject. It could be a name of a restaurant. It could be a name of a church, a name of a school, a name of a local business. Uh, or right here, it's got Barnes Hutchins Cemetery. Maybe there's information about a cemetery in vertical files. So it's important to really study the index to vertical files. 
These records are stored in filing cabinets and stored in the back rooms. Um, ask the archivist about an index. Maybe they have their index for their vertical files online, or maybe the index is in paper form at the archives, or maybe on like an in-house computer at the archives, but they should have an index for you to look at. Here's a photograph of our vertical files. We've actually expanded. We now have four filing cabinets um, and they are literally filled with the, all kinds of documents. Here is a document I found in a vertical file for Jesse Glasgow. Uh, this is an insurance policy. Uh, all of us today, we have our insurance policies for our homes and for our cars and for whatever else, but this is his policy. It's dated September the 19th, 1890. Um, and when you look at it, you look down there, it talks, the first part talks about $500 on his one story frame shingle roof dwelling. It's his homeowner's insurance. And then the next section talks about his personal property, $100 of insurance on his household furniture, beds, bedding, uh, wearing apparel. And so those are his personal property. We do this today, but this is from 1890s and it survived. It's damaged, it has some damage on it, but it survived. And it's something that now I can look at to see what it is that he had. Another type of records collection that I find that genealogists um, either don't use at all or use it very minimally are manuscript collections. Uh, one of the most underused records collections I think out there, and I think it should be the number one records collections that genealogists should be uh, using and accessing. Uh, Manuscript collections are a collection of personal papers, family papers, business records. Uh, maybe it's a civic organization that has all their records together. Uh, and so how I like to describe a manuscript collection, uh, people have asked me over the years how, how to describe a manuscript collection to someone. Because I see manuscript and they think of a book or a manuscript that, you know, that they think of a book or a, um, something that is manuscript. This is how I uh, describe it. So think in your minds about all the genealogical records that you have. Uh, all of the census records, birth records, marriage records, death records. Maybe you have a scrapbook or a diary from your family. You have uh, the family Bible or grandma's quilt, the quilt that your grandmother made. Take all of those materials and put them in boxes. Take those boxes down to your car, put them in the trunk, drive down to the local archive and donate them. That is a manuscript collection. And that's why I say that literally anything can be in them and why they're so important to genealogists. I think it's a must for us to do research in these records. I have actually found more information about my ancestors in manuscript collections than I have in any other record source. So if you're not doing research in manuscript collections, I would really encourage you to do so. Here's a photograph of a processed manuscript collection. This is not what this, this manuscript collection says. This is not what it looks like when they first come to us. Um, they actually look pretty bad. But we, as uh, archivists, we get them organized. We put them in file folders um, and boxes so they're ready for researchers. And this is actually our Irish celebration records collection um, here in Houston County, Tennessee. We um, had the Irish railroad workers that came through here in the 1850s building the railroad. And it was said that the Irish railroad workers looked around at our region and our city, and they said it looked to them like Ireland. It reminded them of Ireland. So they named our city Erin. Well, in 1963, uh, many of the business, local businessmen decided that every community needed a parade and our community didn't have one. So they started the Irish celebration in honor of those Irish railroad workers. And so, we um, have celebrated it every year since. This year we celebrated our 60th Irish celebration. Uh, and so this, these are records from that celebration. Over the years, programs have been collected, photographs, newspaper articles, all kinds of memorabilia have been collected and are in this collection. And I have people that come to do research in this, especially when it gets close to March when we celebrate this uh, celebration. The most important part of a manuscript collection is the finding aid. Now the finding aid is a document that is produced by the archivist as they are processing the collection. Now this is gonna be your roadmap. This is what's gonna tell you what's in that collection so that you know what to request from the archivist. And I'm gonna show you a piece or a couple of pieces from the Murray Stalker to State uh, collection that we have here in the archives. 
Um, these are stored in back rooms uh, in the vaults or in the stacks as they're called. And again, just like vertical files, you're gonna ask the archivist about an index uh, of their manuscript collections and they should have that for you. Actually, and maybe in an index of their finding aids. Uh, and so you'll need to do that. Here's a photograph of um, the Dixon County Tennessee Archives, which is next door to where I live, the next uh, county over. I took this photograph while I was visiting them several years ago. And the boxes on the shelves are manuscript collections. That's how they're stored. And I can tell you that what's on those shelves, majority of it, if not all of it, is not online. Uh, and so that's why it's important that we go to these places. We talk to them by email, talk to them by phone about what they have in their collections. Here's another fantastic uh, piece of document for Jesse Glasgow uh, that I found in a manuscript collection. This is a receipt for a subscription to the National Tribune. Now, the National Tribune was a Washington, D.C. newspaper. Uh, remember, he lived in Tennessee, and his receipt is dated June 24th, 1889. Again, this was in a manuscript collection, um, a collection of papers that had been kept for years and years and years that had belonged to Jesse, and this is one of those documents. Um, he paid for his subscription through his local post office. He would go down to the local post office, uh, he paid for his subscription to the National Tribune, and then it would come to him in the mail. So he was very literate. Uh, I found that out. And he was always seemingly uh, keeping his finger on the pulse of what was going on in the nation. Loose records. This is another type of record source that are fantastic. A lot of the records I've already shown you are considered loose records. So what are loose records? These are records that are associated with those bound volumes. Many of us know what the bound volumes are. Whenever we find the last will and testament, it's usually in a bound volume or a marriage record or a vital record, um, a court case or a deed. They're usually in those big bound volumes. Well, many of these records have what are called loose papers or working papers associated with them. But what does that mean as far as for you as a researcher? Well, what is found in the bound volumes may not be the entire story. The loose records could contain more information. Here's an example of that. This is a circuit court loose record. Uh, all of these documents were trifolded and placed into that brown packet that you see on the left. And so in the archives world, we would take all these out, we would unfold them and flatten them. Um, and this is from 1952. This is uh, state of Tennessee, it's a criminal record, versus William Hughes. And he was being charged with going armed with a straight razor. Now, when I was processing this, I took the documents out, I unfolded them and flattened them. And then I realized there was still something in that packet. So when I reached in there to get it and pulled it out, it was the actual razor that he had been going armed with. Uh, and so for us in the archives world, we were very excited. And we have kept it and it's with the court case. So if anyone comes along that's related that wants to see this court case, they'll actually get to see this piece of memorabilia. And I can tell you that that razor is still very, very sharp. So here's what those bound volumes look like. Many of us have done research in these. These ones we pretty much know, these are bound volumes. This one is the Circuit Court Mini Book from 1952 where Mr. William Hughes's case is listed. Well, what has happens is that in these bound volumes, it's usually not the entire story. It's a synopsis of the case. Um, it's just a piece or a part of the story. And in the loose records is where you're going to find the rest. The loose records are going to be additional documents uh, of information that goes with the information you found in the bound volumes. So if you find something in a bound volume, don't stop there. Ask the archivist, do you have any loose records or any other documents that go with what's in these bound volumes? So examples of some loose records are some loose marriage records. Many of you will know about probably loose court records or loose court packets as they're called. Also remember if you find a last will and testament or even if you don't, there are probate records. And that's all times those are called probate packets. And they look just like what I showed you. They're records that are trifolded and stuck into an envelope like that. So those were called loose records. Uh, this is also considered a loose record. If you've ever ordered or gotten military pension records. Uh, this is actually Jesse Glasgow's Civil War Pension Increase Certificate from March the 3rd, 1883. He served with the 83rd Illinois as a Union Regiment. Uh, funny story, uh, this is how you learn as a genealogist. Many years ago when I first found out that he had fought in the Civil War, 
Um, I live about 20 minutes from the Battle of Fort Donaldson, the battlefield of Fort Donaldson. It's a, it's a park now, a state park. And I thought to myself, how, when in the world did he ever go to Illinois to join this regiment when he's always lived in Tennessee? I come to find out this 83rd Illinois was actually at Fort Donaldson. And I figured out that Jesse Glesko joined this regiment at Fort Donaldson. And so his paperwork actually says that. And so that's something I learned. And a couple of my husband's ancestors actually did this. They joined uh, regiments at the battlefield, and sit, and especially if it's another state regiment like the Illinois or an Ohio or something. Uh, and so that's very interesting. But this is his actual Civil War pension increase certificate. He did get his increase. Uh, he was um, he had lost the use of his arm through the war. Uh, he went on to still do everything that he did normally, but he was a little bit sickly as he got into his elder age and he got his uh, pension. Scrapbooks. Uh, scrapbooks are fantastic. I do actually do a whole presentation on scrapbooks. Uh, I love scrapbooks. I love to process them in the archives. I love to do research in them. I've actually been known to travel to other archives to look at scrapbooks, even though they have nothing to do with my family's because I just think they're very, very interesting. They're personal, they're one of a kind, uh, they're put together by individuals. And so you just never know what you're going to find in a personal scrapbook. And yes, I've even seen people paste original documents such as an original birth certificate or an original death certificate. Those records that we're always looking for, they could be pasted in scrapbooks. Uh, this is a photograph of just a few of the scrapbooks we have in our archives. Um, Many archives, when you go researching in them, are going to have many uh, are, uh, scrapbooks that you might want to look at. They could contain uh, rare documents, ones that um, it's the only one that survives, unique documents. Uh, but most importantly, it's going to have documents in there that you're probably not going to find in any other record source. And hopefully it's going to tell you something new about your ancestor that you didn't know. This is actually a document I found in the scrapbook that had nothing to do with my, with my husband's ancestor. Um, I don't even know how it got into the scrapbook. It belonged to someone else. Uh, and actually made me go down a rabbit hole. If you ever been researching and gone down a rabbit hole, you will understand. Well, this is a receipt from the Germanian National Bank where Jesse Glasgow purchased a Louisiana state lottery ticket. Uh, it's dated June the 9th, 1888. Well, first of all, I thought to myself, I didn't even know they had lotteries back then. Uh, and so if you ever want to go down a rabbit hole, just Google Louisiana lottery 1888 and just start reading. It is fascinating. And again, I asked myself the question, when did he go to Louisiana to purchase a lottery ticket? He always lives in Tennessee. Well, as I did research and I looked up things, I found that the lottery actually advertised in newspapers across the country. Uh, and I found where they were advertising in the newspaper that Jesse Glasgow would have received. And it was very easy to uh, purchase your lottery ticket. All you had to do is go down to the post office and purchase your lottery ticket. And so if you look down there at the bottom, it's got a number 92074. That's his lottery number. And so another thing that they did as well is they would publish the winning lottery numbers in the newspaper. And so I haven't yet found his number in the newspaper. So I don't know if he's actually won or not. Some scrapbooks have journaling included in them. Those are fantastic as well. Uh, they would, people will paste things in their scrapbook, but they also may journal or put notes in there about whatever that item is, uh, their memory from that day. And so that's an extra bonus for us as genealogists. Old letters and diaries. Um, I don't have very many in my family history, my family genealogy, but I love reading them in the archives. They can contain so much information. Uh, old letters and diaries are fantastic. It can be found in just about any archive. They can be a wealth of information for us as genealogists. Uh, they're, uh, these are some of the most personal records that you can find because a lot of times they're talking about things and sharing things in these that they wouldn't share in public with anybody. Here's some examples of some old letters. These are from Marie Stockard's collection. Uh, these are were written by her sons during World War II and they were saved and they are in our archives. As you can see, they come in all different shapes and sizes, all different shapes and sizes of stationery, uh, but they are usually great things to sit and read. These are gonna be found in manuscript collections. Remember, we just talked about manuscript collections, what they were, 
Um, so you're going to find old letters and diaries in manuscript collections. You may even find that some of these old letters and diaries have firsthand accounts of family history. Uh, events that happened at that time may be recorded in these old letters and diaries. You may have been told a story from one of your family members, your grandmother, your aunt, uh, your parents. And you may find no letter or a diary where it's talked about and you can get more information about it or at least confirm the story that you were told. You may even find vital information such as birth, marriages and deaths in old letters and diaries where there's no actual birth records available, death records available. Maybe they recorded this information in the old letters and diaries and you can get that information from there. Um, this is, we're back to Jesse Glasgow again, and you're going to see me when I go back to his timeline, just how much we've been able to add. Uh, this is a postcard from Jesse Glasgow's daughter, Almeida Ann Glasgow Bertram, dated June 14th, 1886. Now, Almeida Ann is my husband's direct ancestor. That is his second great-grandmother, Jesse Glasgow's daughter. Uh, this is the only correspondence and all, really the only thing I have with her handwriting. Uh, her, her spelling is atrocious. Uh, but they're talking about some, some lawyer thing and some legal stuff. That's what she's talking to her dad about. But it is a piece of uh, correspondence that I've been able to find. And now I can document whatever information is in there. And I also have her handwriting, which is always fantastic to get. So we're back to his timeline and look how it's grown. This is what I'm talking about doing timelines. Um, it can be a little tedious sometimes. But it's actually very rewarding. When I am able to add to my ancestors' timeline, I feel a sense of accomplishment. So let's look and see what we've added. We've added that 1883 Civil War pension increase document. We've added that 1886 postcard from his daughter that I just showed you. Uh, that 1888 receipt from the Louisiana lottery ticket, which is phenomenal. It's fantastic. How many people can say that their ancestor purchased a Louisiana lottery ticket? How many people have that kind of evidence? Um, that 1889 receipt for that subscription to the Washington, D.C. newspaper, the National Tribune. And in 1890, where he paid $12 for his home insurance. So his timeline is getting really full. And I'm going to continue to add to it. So tell your ancestors' story, whether that's in a timeline, whether that's in a narrative, whether that's in making up your own scrapbook. You need to tell your ancestor's story because if you don't tell it, it's going to be lost. So we need to tell our ancestor's story. So use the records and resources available to you wherever you are or online, which is fantastic, but also contact those repositories that are in the places where your ancestors lived, those archives, those libraries, those genealogical societies, wherever those records are. If you can't travel, that's fine. We've got all kinds of ways to communicate with these places now. Send them an email, drop them, call them on the phone, contact them through their social media pages. I've done that too. Uh, I have found that uh, more and more they're becoming more available and uh, much easier and much better to respond. So use those sources that you have to at your uh, fingertips and get those records and help to tell your ancestor's story. So thank you very much for attending this presentation. Please visit my blog, A Genealogist in the Archives, and uh, find me on Facebook. Uh, look for The Archive Lady, and please like my page. And here is my email address. If you have any questions after uh, this, please drop me an email. I'll be glad to answer anything that you have. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Suzanne for any questions. Okay, class, if you'd like uh, to ask us a question, please unmute your microphone. But because we're recording, uh, please leave your cameras off. So I'll go ahead and open the floor. I like your background, uh, I, Todd. <laughs> thanks. Hey, I was, it, I don't have a question, but um, I did see the postmark on one of those envelopes for the stock, uh, Miss Stockard. Yeah. Um, Camp Blanding, Florida. Yeah. I attended uh, ROT, when I was ROTC in college, we went to Camp Blanding, Florida. So about fantastic 40 plus years later you know he was there in 42 i was there in 85 that's, <laughs> a, that's like a good that. no 87 i guess it was but yeah that was interesting <laughs> you know melissa one of the biggest reasons i do my class every week is to expose everyone uh, that attends the lab to the incredibly large amount of variety of records that are out there 
um, mm -hmm. just and basically learning how to, like you said today, fill in the blanks. Um, yes. and, and I just really think today's presentation was like a, a really great reinforcement of that, that thought that every time you think you've found everything that there is to find, <laughs> there's always an avalanche more out there waiting to be found. It's just a matter of how much, like you said, the exhaustive research you know, process that you're going to do to find it. And that's why I include a lot of examples in my presentations is because it's one thing to tell someone about, hey, there's this, there's that. But when I include the actual documents and photos and things, I think it really gets you excited about what maybe you can find. Very inspiring. Um, I, want, I do want to know, where did you find the Civil War pension record that you found? Um, the, all the records that you see, a couple of them I found in the sources that I told you about, but majority of them I actually found at an archive uh, that is next door to me. But we call them our sister county because part of our county was formed out of them. But I was actually attending the Archives Institute at the Tennessee State Library and Archives uh, to be, I was being trained as an archivist. And I was in class and there was a lady sitting next to me and she started talking about this collection of records that she, they didn't know how to archive, that they had found in a box of other records that had nothing to do with each other. And so she was talking about these records and then she dropped the name Jesse Glasgow and I just about fell out of my chair and I couldn't say anything because we were in class. And so I waited, waited, waited and the class was over. And I asked her, I said, what kind of records have you got? I said, when you get back home, you scan them and send me every document. And so what it was is there was an envelope and it had March 1892 on the outside of it. And that was the year that he died. And inside that envelope was about 60 to 70 original individual documents. And one of those documents was that Civil War pension increase. Wow. And that and that actual that increase that document the that's not even on paper it's almost like it's on um, some sort of vellum or uh, fabric. And so these records she sent me she said you want them all scanned back and front and I said yes I want everything because I want to know every piece of information. So a few years later she had passed and her son took over the archives over there and one day he brought me all of those records because they still had them in a box marked miscellaneous they really didn't know what to do with them. So he said, since I was, uh, we were a descendant of his, he brought me all those original records and gave them to me. Oh my. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Well, it pays to network, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> Suzanne, now, I had a question. This is yeah. Carrie. Uh, I want to thank Melissa. She'd helped me quite a few years ago with some Doubleday families in Tennessee. Good. And I appreciate her help. On the school records, how do you start that search? Um, school records is something that um, I think that should be a must for every genealogist. I mean, they, they're, not, they're not what I call sexy records to research, but they're fantastic. Uh, if they exist, that's the thing, if they exist. I would start with the local school board because they may still be languishing in back rooms in local school boards, but hopefully they've been transferred to a local historical society or genealogical society, or if they have a county archive. That's what happened here. Our local school board, I'm also, I'm the archivist, but I'm also the county records manager here. And so the local school board said that they had a building that had records in them that they did, we wanted to get rid of all the records. And they knew that they couldn't just get rid of them. They have to be approved. And so the way that they get approved is they have to go through me. And so we met one day at that, um, that building and the building had holes in the ceiling, holes in the floor, it was raining that day. And they showed me these filing cabinets. There was about 20 to 30 filing cabinets. And in these filing cabinets were school registers dating back to the 1920s. And the school registers, and, uh, registers were, were those registers that the teachers used on a daily basis to write all their children's names, their, their attendance, their, their grades, everything. And they had been kept. And I said, we've got to get these records out. And so we transferred them. But if school records exist, uh, we we'll start with the local school board. Uh, they may or may not know where they're at. Uh, so, but don't give up. Even if they say they don't exist, we threw them away. Keep looking because I find that um, people who are like in courthouses or school boards that are doing the work of today, they may not know where they're at. And so they may say, oh, they probably were thrown away. So I never take that for an answer. I always continue searching. Um, but school board minute books also are fantastic records. And some of those are actually have been microfilmed. So you may find them at a state archives or maybe even on family search. If you search the catalog for the area where your ancestors were, look at the catalog, see if they have school records. Um, because school board minutes to me are fascinating to read because they talk about how the schools were built, 
They talk about um, if someone wants to complain about their child riding the school bus, it could be in there. Uh, and so school board minutes are fantastic as well. Harry, I'd like to add something to that. Um, I was doing a um, genealogy um, field trip of my own a couple of years ago, and my mom's family came from a little town in North Dakota, and it's still a little town. Uh, to this day, it's still a little town. And I went there and I went to the actual school district office for K through 12. And sure enough, they had the, those old records in a filing cabinet right there uh, because mm -hmm. once again, it's a small community. So it's not like, you know, they had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students and they were kind enough to Xerox them for me and gave them to me. And it was really kind of wonderful because I could match it to the articles I'd found in their local newspaper in, you know, in old, you know, archive newspapers, because back in those days, they would give you the names of everybody who graduated from one grade level to the next in the newspaper. Yeah. And especially if they had honorary mention, like they were an all A student or something like that. So it, perfect it really, attendance. yeah, exactly. Perfect mm -hmm. attendance. It, exactly. So it was that, the, that school board record went directly with my proof that I had already found on their education through the local newspapers. So it, it went hand in hand and it was a really wonderful experience. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see here. Karen says old scrapbooks have acid pages. So I've taken documents out and put them in archival scrapbooks. Maybe Melissa, you could talk a little bit about acid uh, situation for the class. Uh, sure. Um, and what she did is, is correct. I mean, you can do that. Now there's instances where things are pasted in scrapbooks. I don't know what kind of glue that they use, but it's industrial glue and you're not going to get it out. And so in the archives world, what we do is we interweave archival tissue paper between each page and leave the scrapbook as it is and put it in an archival box. What's important to remember when you're doing something like that, whether you're, you're taking out things out of a scrapbook or out of a photo album, is what you keep in what we call original order. Um, what's one of the first things we learned to be an archivist is you keep things in original order. Meaning if you're going to take something out of a scrapbook and put it in archival sleeves in another book, keep it in the same order that the person who made the scrapbook, because it may not look like that they're in any kind of order, but maybe they are. Maybe it's in chronological order. Maybe it's in um, a storytelling type of order, but that's what we need to do. But if you can, you should use all archival materials to store your genealogical records and things. Um, it's a lot more expensive to purchase archival materials, um, but if you can, I would encourage it. Great advice. Um, do you have a particular vendor that you would recommend? I, we actually use Gaylord Archival. Um, you just go Google G-A-Y-L-O-R-D. Uh, they've always been really good for us for the past 10 years that I've been an archivist. Uh, but there's others out there that you can use. But like I said, I use Gaylord. And Gaylord actually sells their products on Amazon. Oh, good. OK. Not all, not all of their products, but a, a lot of their products. Wonderful. OK, uh, class, any other questions? Beth made just a comment. She says um, in the chat box, she says, I can't look right now, but I believe one of my father's ancestors lived in Stewart County, Tennessee for a time. Uh, she's going to go back and check that out as soon as she gets the well, opportunity. If you, if you find that she has, please drop me an email. Um, I'm actually going to the Stewart County Archives on Tuesday. I go there uh, often because, like I said, we're sister counties because, like I said, our county was formed from parts of their county and um, we're good friends with their archivists. So I might be able to look up something for you. So give me an email, drop me an email. Oh, there you go, Beth. No better opportunity you're gonna get than that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, any other questions? Give it a few seconds. Oh, she says thanks. Beth says thanks in the chat box. Okay, before uh, we say goodbye to our guest speaker today, uh, and before I stop the video, um, first of all, I want to thank you, Melissa, for once again being kind enough to allow us to videotape. And it'll take a few weeks to get this up on our YouTube channel, but our marketing department will get that done. And then uh, also, uh, for those of you uh, who would like to stay for the second half of class, um, I invite everyone, of course, to stay. And our second half of class is lots of fun where we all, sometimes we just talk about hot genealogy topics. Uh, other times we actually work on, on brick walls and uh, we, we use the collective knowledge of everyone who stays uh, to help each other. So I want to invite everyone to stay. And then uh, also, if you're not going to stay and you're going to be leaving us after our guest speaker signs off, uh, I want you to know that if there's anything in the chat box that you wanted to download, 
Uh, please download the chat box before you leave, because even if you log back in, you'll lose the chat box information. So uh, if there's something in there, just click on those three little dots you see in the bottom of the chat box, and that'll download the entire chat box to your computer. So with that, um, Melissa, I will say once again, thank you very much for joining us today. We, we always enjoy your expertise and, and you're so generous with your time. We really appreciate that.